Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start. Today I'm going to uh, show you approximately half of what displacive transformations are about. And at the end of the lecture, I expect that there will be some confusion, okay, which we will not solve in this lecture, but which will be solved in the next lecture. So if I asked you, first of all, what are the characteristics of Martin-Siddick transformation, then one of the key characteristics would be, of course, that it's a deformation, so you're able to see displacements. So when we look at all the transformations all the important transformations that we get in steels, we can divide them into two kinds. One which involves a displacement that changes the crystal structure of the parent from the product. So when you look at the sample and you see it transforming, you'll be able to see a change in shape. So this includes, for example, Riedmann staten ferrite, bainite and acicular ferrite, and martensite. Crystallographically, these are essentially the same transformations. They happen at different temperatures and different driving forces, so there are different uh, characteristics, but crystallographically these will be identical and all of them produce an invariant plane strain shape deformation. Now, of course, when you produce a shape deformation, imagine that you've got a crystal of martensite or bainite forming inside steel, surrounded by thousands of other crystals, and it's trying to cause a change in shape. There'll be a lot of strain energy. So these are not going to be equilibrium transformations. They only happen when there isn't sufficient atomic mobility. So all of these transformations are less favored thermodynamically compared with these transformations which involve diffusion. In other words, there's sufficient atomic mobility to minimize the free energy. So the formation of allotromorphic ferrite, idiomorphic ferrite, massive ferrite, and perlite, they cannot actually form without long-range diffusion. So all of these transformations, if I polish a crystal of austenite completely flat and I form any of these transformation products, then the crystal will remain flat. There are no displacements because diffusion is like fluid flow. Any change shape is created by diffusion in order to minimize the strain energy. So these are the two major classes of uh, transformations and they are distinguished by the fact that you can physically see displacements, okay? I'm just going to show you quickly uh, a movie. Okay, j just watch this. This is taken by Junhak Pak in, in GIFT. Uh, this is a sample of polycrystalline austenite and it's cooling. Uh, the technique here is laser confocal optical microscopy, and you'll see the displacements happening. Why has it stopped? Oh, because the internet connection is slow today, actually. There you go. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, you have to be really foolish to say that this is not a displacive transformation. You can see the displacements happening as the transformation propagates. So there was a temperature gradient across this sample and that's why it started at one end and finished at the other, okay? So these are physical displacements which you can see with your own eyes. And there are many consequences which we'll explore today. Okay. Of course, one of the key characteristics of Martin Sight is that you will observe displacements, okay? So it's a strain energy dominated transformation. What are the other characteristics that you know about Martin Sight? So you've studied quite a lot during your undergraduate years. What, what are the other characteristics that you could list for Martin Sight? It's a displacive transformation. What else? 
Sorry. I can't hear you. Athermal. So what does athermal mean? Athermal means that if I cool below the Martin's I start temperature, then I will get a certain volume fraction of transformation. If I continue to hold at that temperature, there will be no further increase in transformation. Okay? So thermal activation plays a very small role in Martin's aesthetic transformation. So that's good. What else? I, you know, my, my hearing is not so good. Hmm? Best. Best. Oh, fast. <laughs> fast, yes, sorry. So the transformation is fast. And if I say that the fastest solidification experiment ever achieved is about 80 meters per second, Martin Siddick transformation can happen at the speed of sound in the, in the metal. And that means typically of the order of a thousand meters per second. Okay. So this transformation can happen very fast, but it can also happen very slowly. Okay. It simply depends on how much driving force there is for transformation. But the fact is that it can happen very rapidly. It need not happen very rapidly. What else do you know? Very, very basic principle is missing so far. Sorry? Diffusionless. So diffusionless means that it must have the same chemical composition as the austenite. Okay? So there's no diffusion during the formation of martensite. That is the reason why it can grow very rapidly. Okay? And what about the temperature where it forms? Can you comment on that? Is it a low temperature or a high temperature? Okay, so let's assume that it's low for the moment because it forms under conditions where atomic mobility is limited. Okay? Otherwise, it's not an equilibrium transformation and other phases are favored. It's simply because kinetics favors it at low temperatures where atoms are less mobile. What about the shape? What is the shape of martensite? three-dimensional shape. Yeah. Plate, yeah? It's a plate shape. That means, you know, rather like a book in three dimensions. Okay? So two large dimensions and one very thin dimension. So we need to be able to explain all of these characteristics with any theory that we have. Okay, so I'm going to start by listing what is experimentally known about martensite. So we argued that, you know, the temperature at which martensite forms is low because it forms in circumstances where atomic mobility is small. But look over here, this is zirconia, it's a ceramic. And the martensite start temperature for that is 1200 Kelvin. Okay, now 1200 Kelvin in the case of a ceramic is a temperature where diffusion is slow. Okay? So it isn't that we will necessarily form at low temperatures, but you can form at incredibly low temperatures, for example, 4 Kelvin. There's no possibility at all of diffusion at 4 Kelvin. So the actual temperature at which martensite forms depends on how easy it is for atoms to move in that particular substructure. Okay? This is a, uh, an argon nitrogen solid solution. The reason why I put that down is to show you that it can actually form in many different things, okay? not just steels. It is most important in steels, but you can even get martensitic transformations in crystalline polymers. Okay? They are of little importance, but it is a general phenomenon. Now, we need to be able to predict if I, if I give you a crystal of nickel, okay, and uh, it is going to be in the face-centered cubic structure, and I ask you the question, is it possible to get martensitic transformation in pure nickel? How would you answer that, okay? So we've got to develop the theory to be able to say, this material will transform into martensite, this will not, 
So not everything transforms into mitensite, but it isn't restricted to iron. Now, nobody mentioned that mitensite is hard or brittle, right? Now, it's good you didn't mention that because mitensite can be very soft. Look at that, copper aluminum mitensite is soft, whereas zirconia is very hard because in ceramics dislocations have great difficulty in moving. And in the case of steel, you can get large differences in hardness. So can you explain to me why this mitensite is much harder than this mitensite? Carbon. Carbon has a very potent effect because if you remember lecture number three where we looked at interstitials, causes a tetragonal distortion, and that tetragonal distortion can interact strongly with dislocation strain. So mitensite can be hard, but it need not be hard. And indeed, uh, if you look at, um, uh, for example, an iron manganese alloy, and you form mitensite, it'll be soft mitensite. My raging steel has almost zero carbon, so when you quench it to mitensite, it's very soft. Okay? So mitensite need not be hard, but it can be hard. It need not form at low temperatures, but it can form at low temperatures. And it need not grow rapidly but it can grow extremely rapidly and you can get acoustic emissions when martensite forms because if it forms very rapidly then you can hear clicks, right? So if you have an Android phone, you can download an application, uh, search for impurity and you can hear the martensite as it forms, okay? That was created, by the way, by Jehun Chang in GIFT, the Android application. This is a, a martensitic transformation in a living material. Okay, so this is a schematic diagram of a virus, and you can think of a virus as having a head and a couple of arms, right? And the sole purpose is that the arms can hold on to a bacterium, so underneath we have a larger bacterium, and the DNA that's present here is then injected into the bacteria where it multiplies. So this is the mechanism by which a virus can reproduce. Viruses do not have sex, okay? They reproduce simply by putting their DNA inside bacteria where it multiplies. Now, what is the relevance to martensite? Well, look, over here you have a long, thin tube, and over here you have a short, fat tube, and that's acting like a hypodermic needle. And this is actually a cylindrical crystal which undergoes martensitic transformation and therefore causes the mechanical operation of that needle. So here is the, what happens. This is the lattice of the parent and this is the lattice of the product. So by changing the crystal structure, it does a mechanical operation. Emphasizes again that martensitic transformation is a combination of a deformation and a crystal structure change. These are real pictures. Uh, this is bacterium and this is a virus. And here you can see them latching on to the bacterium and then there's a contraction of that cylindrical crystal which allows the DNA to enter the bacterium. And of course, once that has happened, this is dead because there's no DNA left inside that virus, but it multiplies inside the bacterium. And the same crystallographic theory applies to this as to iron alloys. Okay, so the proof that it is a diffusion transformation, how can we prove that something is diffusionless? What is the experimental technique you would use to prove that a transformation is diffusionless? Any ideas how you can prove that it, it is diffusionless? How about chemical analysis? Okay. You can analyze the crystal of martensite and show that it's exactly the same as that of the austenite, right? That would prove that it was diffusionless. And of course, you can argue that yeah, if the bulk composition might be identical, but there is some diffusion at the interface, but nowadays you have techniques such as the atom probe, 
which also lets you look at the chemical composition at the interface. Okay? And by doing that, you can absolutely prove that it's a diffusionless transformation. So the fact that it can form at temperatures as low as 4 Kelvin means it must be diffusionless. And it can grow at the speed of sound inside the metal. You cannot possibly get diffusion if something is growing at 1,000 meters per second in the case of the solid state. And there is, of course, no composition change because we can do chemical analysis on the finest conceivable scale, individual atoms, and show that there is no diffusion during martensitic transformation. Now, this is what uh, a high carbon martensite would look like. Uh, the white region is the austenite, and these are the plates of martensite, different uh, length, lengths of plates. And notice that you do not see any round sections here. Okay? It's wrong to refer to martensite as needles, because if it's a needle, then there's a very high probability that you will see round or elliptical sections. You do not see that. These are sections of a plate in three dimensions. Now, the average plane here is known as the habit plane. Okay? Uh, one reason why it's called a habit plane is because it's a reproducible plane. If you measure the plane and then you do an experiment on the next day, again, it will be exactly the same plane. So it has the habit of forming on particular crystallographic planes. So we call this average plane here the habit plane. Of course, you can see that even from this micrograph that, look, the habit plane of this plate of martensite is the same as this plate of martensite, even though they are different plates. Similarly, this one and this one and so on. So they are clearly forming on specific crystallographic planes. Now, in the micrograph that I just showed you, it's a polycrystalline material, uh, and basically when the martensite forms, it's constrained by its surroundings. There are many crystals around it. Okay? So it adopts a shape which is like that of a thin plate, but if I took a single crystal of austenite and transformed it into martensite so that it's just pushing against air, then this plane here would be exactly the same as the average plane here. But you wouldn't see a thin plate shape because there's no elastic constraint around that plate of martensite. Now, the first puzzle is that the plane on which martensite forms is very strange. Okay? It's not a close packed plane. It's not even a plane which you can express in terms of integers. It's an irrational plane. So, for example, 1 over square root of 2 is called an irrational number because it's just 0 0.7071, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Just like that, I can't say that martensite forms on a 315-10 plane. It forms approximately parallel to a 315-10 plane because the real plane is irrational. Okay? And why even if if these indices were integral, why would it form on a 315-10 plane? Or if I change the composition on a 252 plane or 295? These are very strange crystallographic indices. When we look at slip, slip happens on closed back planes, right? And closed back directions, very simple. And when we look at twinning, twinning happens on closed back planes and closed back directions. But martensite does not. The planes here are irrational, with strange indices, with change with chemical composition. Okay? So whatever theory we have must be able to explain this. The orientation relationship uh, is usually a close back plane from the parent and the product are approximately parallel and close back directions within those two planes are approximately parallel, but not exactly. So the 111 austenite plane is not exactly parallel to a 011 ferrite, as you will read in thousands of papers where they talk about the Kerjimov-Sachs relationship. Kerjimov-Sachs relationship has exactly 111 parallel to 011, 
But if you do accurate measurements, there'll be an angle the order of a half a degree between those planes. Why is that? Why aren't they exactly parallel? And similarly, why aren't the close back directions exactly parallel? Okay. So when you talk about Kojum of Sachs and Nishiyama Vasaman, those are really approximate statements. There's no 111 plane parallel to 011 exactly. There's an angle between those two planes. So we need to explain the second difficulty, which is that the orientation relationship itself is irrational. If you do accurate measurements, you'll find it's not Kojimo Sachs, not Nishiyama Vasaman, but something approximating those two orientations. Okay, we'll skip that. Now, you said that it's an a-thermal transformation. So if you look at the time temperature transformation diagram, and you're looking at perlite, if I hold austenite at this temperature, eventually I get 1% perlite, 50% perlite. At constant time, I will get an increase in volume fraction. That isn't the case for martensite. If I cool to this temperature, I have 50% martensite, irrespective of the time. I have 95% martensite if I cool further. So that's the meaning of air thermal. Thermal activation plays only a very small role in the formation of martensite. So this is a classical equation expressing the volume fraction of martensite as a function of temperature below MS. So this is the martensite start temperature. This is the temperature below martensite start. This is uh, an empirical constant uh, which can be expressed in thermodynamic terms. And this is the volume fraction of martensite. Notice there is no time in this equation, only temperature. Okay? That's the meaning of an air thermal transformation, that it doesn't depend on time. Now, strictly speaking, you know, if you could op make observations which, are, which have a time resolution of one thousandth of a second, then you will see a time dependence. You know, imagine that the plate is growing at a thousand meters per second, and you could observe things at one thousandth of a second, then clearly there is a time dependence, okay? But the point is the time dependence is so small that, in effect, once you've exhausted the nuclei at a particular temperature, the transformation stops. And then you have to undercool more to stimulate further nuclei. That's the basis of this equation, which is called the Koshtanen and Mark equation. Right, I'm going to now talk about the interface between martensite and austenite, but just to revise uh, how we create an interface. Uh, in a previous lecture, we took a single crystal here, we sliced it into two parts and filtered one part with respect to the other by an angle theta. So these two halves are now in a different orientation, and therefore we have a bicrystal. But in the process, we've created an empty space, and that empty space we filled with edge dislocations, an array of edge dislocations. Uh, the spacing D here and the Burgers vector of the dislocation is related to the amount of misorientation we have between the two crystals. So basically, the structure of an interface can be described mathematically in terms of dislocations, but you can actually see those dislocations when you do transmission electron microscopy, so it's a physically correct model. Okay? You can see the arrays of dislocations inside the interface, you can measure the Burgers vector spacings and the misorientation and everything fits together very well. Okay? So this is a physically correct model of an interface, an interface consists of a series of dislocations which are arranged in a wall parallel to the interface plane. Now, there are two kinds of interfaces, just two kinds of phase transformations, the reconstructive, which involve diffusion, and the displacive, which do not involve diffusion. And in the case of a displacive transformation, the interface must be able to move without diffusion. Now, this dislocation can clearly glide because its Burgers vector does not lie in the plane of the interface. So if that interface moves, 
then this crystal will be converted to this without any diffusion, just like slip. Okay? But this time we have a wall of dislocations moving through the parent phase. But if the dislocations are like this, that means the Burgers vector lies in the plane of the interface, there's no way I can move that interface without diffusion because climb would be necessary. Yeah? Everyone familiar with the climb of a dislocation? Yeah, do you know what climb means? Climb of a dislocation? Yeah. So, you know, you've got this extra half plane. If I remove a row of atoms from here by diffusion, then effectively the dislocation is moved up by one plane. Right? But I need to remove that by diffusion. So, an interface like this cannot move without diffusion. We call this a sessile interface. That means it's not mobile unless you have diffusion. Whereas this is just like slip dislocations, where if there's a force of some sort, either a mechanical force or a chemical driving force which wants to change the austenite into inside, then this would be able to glide, and in the process of it would deform this crystal into this. And that's why we get the shape change that we observe. Okay. Is everyone happy with that? So the basic condition for martensitic transformation to be possible is that you must be able to create a glissal interface between the parent and the product phase. Okay, so that's the fundamental principle which I'm going to develop a little bit more. Now, in order to think about this a little bit more, we need to understand what a jog means. Okay? A jog is when a dislocation moving in this direction will cut another dislocation which has a different line vector. Okay? So when it cuts, this dislocation will leave a step on this one by its Burgers vector, and this one will acquire a step which is given by the Burgers vector of the other dislocation. So here is an illustration. We've got two dislocations with different line vectors. The Burgers vectors are pointing differently. This is a screw dislocation and this is an edge dislocation. When they cut, the edge dislocation acquires a line vector parallel to this because the Burgers vector 2 will create a step on dislocation 1 here. This is parallel to B2, this step. But of course, the Burgers vector is constant along a dislocation line. Right? So, what we've done is this edge dislocation has acquired a step here, which is effectively a screw dislocation. And this screw dislocation here has acquired a step which has made this component an edge because the Burgers vector here is pointing this way and the line vector is pointing this way. Now, a screw dislocation can glide on any plane which contains that screw, right? It can glide on any plane which contains that line vector. But once you put a jog, that's not possible. So by creating jogs, you can make dislocations sessile. Okay? You can stop them from moving you might need to have climb in order for this component of that dislocation to move. What this means is that in a martensite austenite interface, you cannot have two sets of dislocations. You can only have one array of dislocations. Okay? A general interface can have three different orientations of dislocations but a martensite interface must have only one set of dislocations, otherwise they will interfere with each other and create an interface which requires diffusion. Okay. Now, what does that mean? We, we can only have one set of dislocations in a martensite austenite interface. Okay. So, if I'm looking down at the interface in a transmission electron microscope, I should only be able to see one set of dislocations. Now, if I see only one set of dislocations, then I cannot have any distortion between the austenite and martensite along this line. Because if I have any distortion, I might need to add another set of dislocations to compensate for that misfit. 
Therefore, this line must be a coherent line between austenite and martensite. Okay. If it's not a coherent line, I will require another set of dislocations to compensate for the misfit, and then my interface will not be glissile. So, we can alter our fundamental principle for martensitic transformation, uh, which comes from the fact that the interface must be glissile, and say, that there must be at least one line in the interface between martensite and austenite which is fully coherent. It is undistorted and unrotated, which means it's an invariant line. If you cannot find a single line which is coherent between the two crystals, it's impossible to get martensitic transformation. Okay. So if I go back to my nickel example, where the structure is FCC and I want to transform it into BCC. If I cannot find a coherent line between the FCC and BCC because the lattice parameter is such and such, then it's impossible to get martensitic transformation even though the FCC structure may not be stable. Okay? So that's the fundamental principle in whatever material you're looking at, whether it's plutonium, and plutonium has a whole series of martensitic transformations. You cannot get martensite unless you get a fully coherent line. Okay? Now it's very easy to see whether you can have a, get a fully coherent line or not by doing uh, you know, the sort of uh, analysis we did with the Bain strain. It's very easy to see. So we can prove whether a particular structure can transform martensitically or not by finding at least one coherent line. If you find two coherent lines, that's even better because that will be a coherent plane. And the further uh, corollary from this is that the interface energy will be quite low because you have this line which is fully coherent. Okay. So typically the interfacial energy between martensite and austenite is less than 0 0.2 joules per meter squared whereas a typical grain boundary energy would be about 0 0.6 joules per meter squared. Okay. So there's a great deal of coherency between martensite and austenite. <coughs> okay, so just to summarize, uh, a glissile interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations because then the dislocations will interfere, create jogs, and then the interface cannot move without diffusion. And martensite is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent into the product leaves one line completely coherent, completely invariant. Okay. Undistorted and unrotated means a coherent line. So the minimum condition is that we must be able to change the parent into the product by a deformation which is an invariant line strain, leaves one line unchanged. So it's a very powerful result actually. You can now predict in any material whether or not you will get martensitic transformation. And this is just to show you a comparison of um, interfacial energies. This is the gamma martensite interfacial energy, 0 0.2 joules per meter squared. A twin boundary is approximately the same. An incoherent grain boundary would be about 0 0.8, and the surface energy of wind glass is of the order of 1 joule per meter squared. So this, this is a reflection of the level of coherency we have in the interface. Now, there are many methods by which you can study the displacements due to martensite. And this is one of uh, those methods. It's called uh, uh, Nomaski Inference Optical Microscopy, where basically the different colors represent different degrees of tilt of the surface. But this is not an etched specimen. This is a specimen where we have polished the austenite, allowed it to transform to martensite, and what we are seeing is deformations. So in the first movie that I showed you, we were using laser confocal uh, optical microscopy. Here we are using uh, nomadic interference optical microscopy. 
There's another method called Tolansky interference, which will give you interference fringes, so you can very accurately measure the displacements. And finally, if, if your structure is too fine for optical microscopy, so optical microscopy, basically the wavelength of light is of the order of um, half a micrometer. Yeah. So that means that if you're trying to resolve something which is much smaller than that, then it won't work. So atomic force microscopy is what you would use, for example, to look at the displacements due to bainite, which has a much finer plate size. Or if you're looking at a carbide particle forming by a displacive mechanism, you would use atomic force microscopy. Now, when we use those techniques to characterize the deformation, then I've, I've explained to you previously that the shape change that we measure with enormous accuracy is an invariant plane strain, which is a combination of a dilatation normal to the habit plane and a shear strain parallel to the habit plane. So if I add these two up, this is the nature of the shape change that accompanies mitensitic transformation. There's a volume change, but the volume change is not isotropic. It's normal to the habit plane. Okay? And there is a shear strain parallel to the habit plane. And typical magnitudes for steels are 0 0.26 and 0 0.03. In plutonium, there's actually a volume decrease when mitin forms, because when plutonium solidifies, the density of the solid is less than that of the liquid. It's rather like ice and water. So then the solid undergoes a series of martensitic transformations which increase the density. Okay. Now, on a microscopic scale, of course, uh, th this, this kind of thing doesn't happen on a microscopic scale because we've already said the interface consists of a series of dislocations. So when dislocations move, they leave a set of steps, don't they? Yeah. When they move through a crystal, they leave a step. So these steps are very, very small, and that's why we approximate this change in shape as a smooth shape. But it's not really. A, if you, you looked at it with a sufficient resolution, you will see the steps. Okay. Now, why is martensite in the form of thin plates when it forms under constraint? Well, it's very simple. Uh, the strain energy due to the shape change is minimum when the object is in the form of a thin plate. So this is the strain energy per unit volume, and these are the squares of shear and the dilatational strains, and this is the elastic modulus. This part you can understand that the strain energy per unit volume is given by the modulus times the strain squared. We did that in the previous lecture when we were looking at trip steels. You know, the area under the elastic stress strain curve is sigma epsilon, which is the same, uh, is half sigma epsilon, which is the same as elastic modulus times strain squared times half. Okay? But if it's a plastic strain, there's no, uh, no half, so you can easily understand this part of the equation which gives us the strain energy per unit volume. This is much more complicated to derive. Uh, there's a theory called the Ashelby theory which you need to use to derive this term which is the thickness over the length of the plate. Okay. So the strain energy scales with the thickness over the length and therefore the thinner the plate the smaller is the strain energy. But of course if you make the plate too thin, then you're not transforming the material, and the material wants to transform. So a balance is reached between the chemical driving force and the elastic strain energy. If your chemical driving force is large, then you will get fat plates of martensite. If your chemical free energy is not so large, then you will get thin plates of martensite. Okay? So the reason why this is in the form of thin plates is basically minimization of strain energy. And the thickness to length ratio you can understand very easily from this diagram. If I have a thin plate here, then the displacement here is very small. If I have a fat plate, then the displacement is large. It's pushing against its surroundings by a large amount. Even though the strain is the same. The strain is simply this 
divided by this, so the strain is the same, but the displacements are larger and larger as you make your plate fatter and fatter. Okay. So this C over R term comes from a treatment of that problem. Okay. So the reason why the plate is thin is purely elastic strain energy minimized in. And this term is much, much bigger than interfacial energy. It's of the order of 600 joules per mole. Okay, so uh, we've identified some difficulties. Okay. The first one is that we haven't explained why there are some strange habit plane indices like 3, 10, 15, and 2, 5, 9, approximately. Similarly, it's not clear why the close-back planes and close-back directions are not exactly parallel. You know, they're, they're actually irrational, the orientation relationship. There's an angle of something like half a degree between the close-back planes. Why is that? And when we measure the shape deformation, it's an invariant plane strain. That means it's a shear and a volume expansion. Now, an invariant plane necessarily means that there's a coherent interface, fully coherent interface between the austenite and martensite. And in the next lecture, I'll show you that is impossible. Okay? It's impossible to get a fully coherent interface between austenite and martensite. Therefore, the shape change itself is incompatible with what we know about the crystallography of austenite and martensite. Why do we get a fully coherent interface? apparently, when the crystal structure does not allow it. Okay, let's see if we can find at least one line which is coherent between the austenite and martensite because that's the minimum condition for martensitic transformation. So these are our crystal structures, body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic austenite. And you've already seen this. If I put two austenite unit cells next to each other, I can define a body-centered tetragonal austenite cell, so this is still austenite, and then when I apply a deformation which compresses along the z-axis and expands along these two axes, I get my body-centered cubic cell. Now, there are two things to remember here. One is that when I draw this diagram, it automatically implies that 0, 0, 001 of ferrite will be of martensite will be parallel to 0, 0, 001 of austenite because the deformation does not rotate that vector. Yeah, it's simply compression along there. Similarly, it implies that one bar one zero of austenite will be parallel to one zero zero of ferrite. So that orientation relationship is very simple. You know, you've got the cube edges parallel and you've got one of the face diagonals of austenite parallel to a cube edge or ferrite. That is not what we observe experimentally. So although I've mentioned this particular Bain strain many times, okay, when I talk about the transformation from austenite to martensite, it doesn't represent the real orientation relationship. So there's something not right here. Okay, this cannot be the complete story. Let's see, first of all, whether this leaves a single line coherent. Okay. So imagine that we, our austenite is a sphere. Then as a consequence of the Bain strain, it changes into an ellipsoid of revolution about the z-axis. So this is a section of the, z, uh, of the ellipsoid. This is the z-axis. We've compressed there and expanded along here. But two lines here, OA and OB, which change into OA dashed and OB dashed, they are not distorted, okay? But they are rotated, so they are not invariant lines. So the Bain strain does not leave any line coherent. The only way we can recover a coherent line is if I now add a rigid body rotation so that this ellipsoid brings OA dashed into coincidence with OA, but of course I can't bring two lines into coincidence, right? So if I have the Bain strain and a rigid body rotation, it's possible to find a single coherent line. And if you calculate how much rotation is needed, 
you exactly predict the observed orientation relationship, which is irrational and which is close to Kojima of Sachs or Nishiyama Vasana. Okay. So the Bain strain does not give you the correct orientation relationship. It does not give you the coherent line which is necessary for Martin Sadik transformation. But the Bain strain combined with exactly the rigid body rotation needed to create a coherent line precisely predicts the orientation relationship. So one problem is solved. Yeah. Given the lattice parameters of austenite and martensite, and that will depend on chemical composition, you can exactly predict the orientation relationship to an accuracy which is uncanny, you know, very, very high accuracy much higher than normal measurement techniques. Okay? So I will stop there because we've explained one discrepancy, but we've created another one, which is that we can only produce one coherent line, whereas the shape change implies there is a fully coherent plane between austenite and martensite. And we'll solve that in the next lecture. Okay?